mind blow of all by itself. It just, it does it itself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're right there with me though. Every time I open the hangar door to go flying, I realize that I'm one of the lucky guys doing something that I dreamt of as a kid.
I guess I was fairly apprehensive the whole time that I was flying in combat. And, and I guess there's good reason to feel that way. I'm there to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm, and therefore they would like to damage me. And I was 25 years old at that time. Top Gun was really a thrill. I must have done well in actual combat because at the time I was just a lieutenant junior grade, which is a, a first lieutenant in the Air Force. And so I may have been the very first lieutenant junior grade to go through Top Gun. That was the dream of a lifetime come true. I had wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot just like my dad from the time I was 10 years old. STS-27 was my, was my third launch and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. We were a top secret classified Department of Defense mission. So to this day, if I told you what we carried, you could never leave this hangar. Uh, you'd be... <laughs> well, I will never forget, we maneuvered the arm and Mike Mullane was my arm operator. So he moved the arm over there and we brought up the television image of the right wing. And I looked at what I was seeing and I said to myself, we are gonna die. To be an airline pilot, there was mandatory age 60 retirement. I was a NASA astronaut until I was 50 years old. And so I looked at the situation and I had known a number of Southwest Airline pilots. And they were just like me. They were flying because they loved to fly. There's a lot of piloting that goes into it, a tremendous amount of piloting that goes into it because you're going to wind up passing other airplanes. You're, you're going to get in a duel with another airplane that's fairly closely matched. So there's a ton of satisfaction from, from doing that. And hey, let's just talk about the racing itself. It's fun to fly low, but it's dangerous. And so the only time I fly low is at the Reno Air Races. But watching the ground go by you at 400 and 500 miles an hour is pretty darn thrilling because it's, it's really scooting on by. And that's fun. That's really fun. I had always been fascinated by racing planes uh, because they're sleek, streamlined, and they, they, they go real fast. There's that need for speed again, and they're raced around a pylon. And so I determined that I could break the existing altitude record for altitude and horizontal flight for that quarter category of airplane. And in fact, I did that in 1991. And I'm fond of saying that uh, 
If I have done well as an aviator, it's because my dad was the one who taught me how to fly. And he didn't just teach me how to fly, he taught me the why of it as well. He taught me the aerodynamics behind it, the reasons that you're doing things, not just, not just how to do it, but why you're doing it is, is also very important.
Of the 16 million Americans who served during World War II, it is estimated that roughly 168,780 are still alive today. With the current death rate of approximately 234 a day, soon there will be no living World War II veterans left to talk of their experiences. The Fagan Fighters World War II Museum gathered three veterans together during the recent 2022 Ray Fagan Memorial Air Show for a rare opportunity that provided viewers with the chance to listen to them share their experiences that range from the Navy and Army Air Force to the Pacific and Europe. When Donald McPherson was 19, his father urged him to enlist in the Navy so he could fly instead of getting drafted into the infantry. Don entered the U.S. Navy on the 4th of February, 1943. He earned his wings and was commissioned an ensign on August 12, 1944. He was sent to the aircraft carrier USS Essex bound for the combat zone at Iwo Jima. While assigned to Squadron VF-83 flying the F-6F Hellcat, he became one of 12 to score five or more victories during deployment in 1945. His first aerial kills came on April 6th. Then three were added on May 4th, making the 23-year-old Nebraska farm boy a certified fighter ace one of an elite corps of pilots to shoot down five foes in battle. Jim Tyler was a P-38 fighter pilot with the 15th Air Force in World War II. He enlisted in the fall of 1942 and in early spring of 1943, he learned to fly in a Piper J-3 Cub. Tyler went on to Santa Ana, California for classification. Jim flew in 15 missions to Germany and Austria. First as a bomber escort, dropping chaff, making dive bombing runs and strafing enemy positions, and then in bombing missions. <music> Flying ace Huey Lamb, based at Duxford Air Base in England, flew 61 combat missions, 167 hours and 40 minutes combat time in a P-47, and 107 hours and 50 minutes in a P-51 with the 82nd Fighter Squadron. He shot down two and a half aircraft in the air and was responsible for the destruction of three aircraft on the ground. His victories included two German jets. While with the 78th Fighter Group, 84th Fighter Squadron, he became one of the first pilots to shoot down an ME-262. It was clear that none of these men considered themselves heroes. They are humble but proud, and they felt they were just doing the job they were signed up for. And I'll just ask Don, hey, what, what was the, uh, the most difficult um, of your shoot downs? I know you were involved with some, some kamikaze guys that you shot down and a couple bombers. What was, what was the difficult, uh, the most difficult uh, in your shoot downs? I guess the, I would have to say the most difficult ones were the last three that I shot down. Um, it was about to, two to three weeks after the invasion of Okinawa and the, 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 Japan, uh, the American people had uh, positioned destroyers on uh, 
the area between Okinawa and the northern island of Kyushu uh, as radar pickets. They were supposed to use their radar to report any enemy planes that were coming in, you know, so that they could send our fighters in to try to uh, sh shoot them down. Well, on this one particular morning, why we were assigned all of the all of the fighters from the Essex, and then there was one other carrier that had fighter planes in the air. We had been experiencing a lot of kamikaze suicide attacking planes. Well, when we got on station, got over there, the uh, raid has already started. It's just, it's it's estimated now there were between 350 and 400 uh, suicide uh, planes at several different uh, altitude levels coming in. And uh, I was, of course, was flying uh, wing on the division leader in, in the division called Wonder 5. And um, when we got there, we saw two um, Two of the uh, suicide planes, there were float planes that were low on the water and they were uh, heading toward this one destroyer. Well, we were a little higher altitude. We probably were maybe uh, 14, 1500 feet off the water and so we had to dive in order to get to them and, and it ended up that uh, they were so, so slow that we overshot the first one, but I was able to knock the, the second one down. Well, then the division leader got on the, uh, the radio and he said, guys, he said, split up and get all of them that you can. So that's one of the few times that we br broke up and, and didn't uh, stay in formation, you know, as far as our attacking was concerned. So we were all freelancing, hunting out targets and, uh, I picked out another one that was headed for one of the destroyers and I got, knocked it down and, and then I, I found the third one. And by the way, we were having to put our wheels down, our flaps down, and a little, little everything in order to, uh, to be slow enough so that we'd even get a chance of getting a, a short burst at these slow airplanes. So division leader shot down for the section leader uh, he shot down four, and he had had one before, and it ended up that uh, uh, three of the four of us made ace that day. All right, now I guess we need to talk to a P-38 guy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> As you can tell, he's a little fired up about that airplane back there. Um, the fork-tailed devil, as they called it, uh, as I remember. The, the bad guys didn't like that airplane at all. And, uh, and he's got some stories, too. Uh, he didn't get any shoot-downs, but uh, he was on uh, many uh, escort missions and also ground attack missions. And I'll just turn it over to you and uh, let you say a little bit about some of those missions. First, I want to be say, say I'm honored to be up here with these three gentlemen. Very honored. Secondly, I want to thank the Fagans for hosting this magnificent event. It's just wonderful. This is not so much about me. It's about hundreds, literally thousands of young men that did the same kind of training that I did. I started out right after high school, King City, California, flying a Ryan BT, BT-22, which is back there. Took basic training in BT-13, consolidated Volte, advanced in uh, North American AT-6, went to Victorville, California, and flew uh, P-39 for a while. God, it was hot out there, hotter than it is here today. From there, went to Santa Maria, California, learned how to apply my my love. Next to my dearly departed wife, that's my love back there. It's a beautiful airplane, easy to fly. It's just 
I just can't say enough about it. Lockheed did a wonderful job. From there, I went to uh, Hamilton Field, California, and took a train to Newport News, Virginia. Took six days to get to Naples, Italy. And from Italy, we went over to the East Coast, a town called Foggia, and we flew our missions out of there, there in San Severo. On the East Coast of Italy, there's hundreds, there were hundreds of air bases, fighters and bombers, B-17s and B-24s. When we first started flying missions, we were escorting bombers up over Vienna. We mostly precede the bombers at 33,000 feet, oxygen above 15,000. About the fourth mission I was on, I called the captain and I said, I'm, I'm low on fuel, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, just, just follow so-and-so. I followed him and we landed on a little island off the coast of Yugoslavia on a dirt, dirt strip. And the, the Air Force had air fuel in 55-gallon drums, and they hand-pumped fuel out of 55-gallon drums in their plane, enough to get us back to the, to the base at San Severo. I only saw one foreign plane in the air. That was an ME-262. We were flying along southwest of Munich one time, and those, the captain said, drop tanks, drop tanks. Well, by the time we dropped our tanks, those jets were long gone, I'll tell you. And I, I never did see another one, thank God. But uh, I, I had a wonderful experience in the Air Force. I'm honored to be here with these gentlemen. And I love that P-38. <laughs> we're, we're glad they missed, that's all I can say. But as long as we're talking about shoot-downs, I think I've, I've got somebody over here who, uh, that, that ME-262 that you were talking about, um, I think you managed to uh, get two, is that right? I did get a ME-262, and then uh, later I shared on a Rado 234 bomber. Okay. All right, so tell us about the 262 that you got. I w was a wingman uh, at this particular mission, and um, we were strafing, marshaling yards, pretty far into Germany, and my element leader was uh, John I. Brown, and he had been in the RAF, and he had a motto. He said, fight and run away, live to fight another day. So about 15 minutes early, I guess, he and I left and headed back uh, home. And on the way, we were at 15,000 feet, and I saw a bogey. A bogey is an unidentified aircraft, I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, down below, and it was flying about maybe 1,500 feet above the ground. I called it out, and uh, John said, I can't see it. Check it out, and I'll cover you. I said, that's all you need. So I dove, and I was indicating about 490 miles an hour in my P-47D model, which we loved. And uh, I saw it as an ME-262. So I uh, shot in front of him, thinking to alert him so he'd slow down. And uh, then I hit water injection. I gained a little bit. But if he hadn't have turned back to, towards his airfield to lead me over his airfield, that was his plan, which he did succeed doing. And uh, so I cut inside of him, and I got right behind him, and I was about as close as here to that uh, hangar there when I finally, I only had uh, two inboard guns firing because the other outboard uh, guns were uh, out of ammunition. And I hit him, and he went into the ground, and we were about, say, 100 or 200 feet above the ground when that happened. And we were right over this German airfield, and they broke up shooting at me and they hit my airplane pretty good and one of the shots did uh, hit my rudder so I had no rudder control coming back. I'd already shot a 109 before but I told my crew chief George Smith said if I get a victory I'll do a 
Bell Road, Victory Road, or whatever you want to call it. So I came in, I said, no, without a rudder, I'll just come straight in and land, and that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. You, you don't want to do a victory roll with a rudder that doesn't work uh, in a P-47. I will ask, how fast do you think you were going when you finally got it shot down? Actually, uh, you know, like I said, we, I was indicating at 500, but after he turned in, he started slowing down. Okay. And I, I, I would imagine I was going around 200 okay. miles an hour, and, but he, he had to slow down or else he'd have left the field before they had a chance to shoot at me. And uh, th that was, what a, well, that was about the third when we got in our squadron. That was in October, so that was pretty new to the game. I was going to say, not many ME-262s had been shot down at all at that point, right? Uh, there had been a couple, a couple in our squadron. Okay, okay. Wow. Well, this is an event that actually our division was not involved in, but it, it made uh, some of the magazines after the war was over. Uh, it deals with the, uh, the fact that the Navy did everything they could to uh, get uh, down pilots into safety. It ended up that we had a pilot get shot down. At, uh, he had to land in a bay uh, just cl fairly close to a Navy air station. And it was uh, late at night, and so there just no way in the world that they could send a rescue group up for you that, that evening. So the pilot, he got out of course he didn't, had to ditch his plane in the bay and he got out and got it got swam ashore and so he stayed in a wooded area that evening and that night and during the night why uh, there was a uh, railroad tracks that come right around uh, close to the wooded area and and he, at one time a train stopped there and a lot of soldiers started piling out and he thought that was the Japanese trying to find him, but evidently they didn't find him or else they, they stopped for some kind of reason. So he, he survived the night and, and of course the very next day, just as early as they could, why uh, the Navy sent out a, two float planes. Uh, the just the uh, cruiser ships always had a float plane on them and they could set it in the water with a derrick so that they could use those to pick up down pilots. And so they sent uh, uh, two float planes with a fighter escort. And, and of course, when the, the down pilot heard them coming, why he swam back out in the bay so, uh, the, the bay so that he could be picked up. And one of the uh, pilots in the float plane in the ended up uh, landing and taxied as close as he could to the, the swimming pilot and, and he stood up in the, in the cockpit to throw a rope, which to the Navy is called a line, and to him and, and when he tossed the rope he lost his balance and fell out of the cockpit. When he fell out of the cockpit he accidentally kicked the throttle so here we have two two pilots in the water and, and the float plane one taxiing across the bay. So <clears throat> the, the second uh, plane went in and landed and, and picked up both pilots. Well then they flew back to, uh, uh, to a point that was designated ahead of time and they rendezvoused with the rescue submarine both of the pilots got aboard and we stra strafed the, uh, the the plane so the Japanese couldn't get it. And, but anyway, we flew back and that's the only night uh, landing that I ever had to make aboard the Essex. And I was glad that it was, it was the only one. <laughs> Thank you, Don. All right, back to the P-38. Yeah, um, you said it was an easy airplane to fly, but you got two motors out there. And, and I'm just kind of curious, I don't have any P-38 time, 
But, uh, you know, if you lost a motor, um, how big a deal was it? That's one of two things they told us right off the bat was never turn into a dead engine and never point it straight down because the, the P-38 could pick up speed so fast you'd run into compressibility, so I never even tried it. I just want to say I was 20 years old when I was flying combat and we thought we could whip the world and by God we did it. <laughs> yes you did, yes you did and you did it very well, thank you.